My dad, um, he was a great role model. He, he was very active in scouting with me. Now, my, my dad in World War II uh, was deferred, but then when they uh, started the draft, everyone was going. He joined the Marine Corps. But uh, a couple weeks before he was to depart for Paris Island, they passed the age law, and my dad did not have to go, which is good for me because uh, those who went to Paris Island the same time my dad would have landed on Iwo Jima. So I would have probably grown up without a dad. And I had a cousin that was in, in the Marine Corps in the occupation of, um, of World War II in Japan. So that, uh, those were the things that uh, got me oriented towards the Marine Corps. Well, there were many people that influenced uh, myself at uh, St. A's. My uh, Spanish instructor was Carl Viros, a Marine, uh, lost a finger in, uh, in Korea. Jack Lynch, my history professor, was Iwo Jima Guadalcanal, uh, and uh, so they had a great influence and, and helped guide me as I was going through this PLC program and figuring out about being a Marine. But having uh, uh, Veros and, and Lynch, both brother Marines, uh, sure helped a lot. I went to the Officer Basic School at Quantico, Virginia. And uh, at the completion of that, went to a, a month artillery school at Quantico. And then I went off to the 3rd Marine Division, which was my first tour of duty. And uh, I was a forward observer with the, with the artillery, then became a liaison officer. So it was a very uh, uh, exciting tour. And at that point, I realized, you know, this Marine Corps is turning into more of a way of life than a job for me. I went into Vietnam as a forward observer in 1965 and was assigned uh, Echo Battery, 2nd Battalion, 12th Marines, out of my first patrol. And on the 18th of December, uh, we're coming back down out of the Quezon Mountains and, and my company was the rear element security uh, of a battalion movement. And all of a sudden I heard some shooting up forward and didn't think too much of it, but then all of a sudden all hell broke loose because a battalion of, of NVA or regiment uh, well dug in, well camouflaged, uh, tr ambushed the whole battalion at one time. Uh, the initial rounds, uh, they picked out the, uh, Captain Gormley from New Hampshire, our company commander, uh, with his radio operator behind him, and they knew he was a leadership. The initial rounds hit, mortally wounded him, killed the radio operator. And then I uh, see the corpsman, Doc West, go running by me, and he hollers, the skipper's down. And I looked out about 75 yards, and there was a pile of bodies there. Uh, company commander, the radio operator, and a couple other troops. Then uh, um, I realized uh, company commander's down, the radio operator's out there, my scouts are down. So I ran out and picked up Captain Gormley in my arms and brought him back. Uh, he died in my arms. Then I realized, you know, someone's gonna take charge. And uh, so I ran out and took the radio off the dead operator, brought it back, strapped it to myself, called a battalion commander who didn't know me from Adam, let him know that I was a Ford observer, company commander's down, I was taking over the company. He says, well, where's the EXO? And I said, sir, they're all in one hell of a firefight. So I led one counterattack on the infantry that had us pinned down on our right, very bad. And then General Platt, the uh, task force commander, was overhead, uh, Huey. General Platt says, you know, I can turn over some Huey gunships to you. Would they help? I said, you better believe it. So I took over control in the uh, gunships and I ran out and up on a little knoll and I had a 3-5 rocket launcher and I would fire the white phosphorus rounds at, at various targets and then the pilots would hit where I hit. And uh, so we knocked down the fire enough on our right flank that we were able to maneuver around a little bit. On end of the battle, the, the uh, battalion commander got on the hook and he says, you know, you've got to come out. We can't come get you. Well, it was 500 meters between we are and, and rice paddies to the village of Kifu. So uh, I had the engineers blow down some trees, brought in helicopters to take out the dead and the wounded. And then we started uh, squads at a time. I told them, run as fast as you can. The only time you stop is some of the Marine gets shot. You stop and pick them up because we don't leave anybody on the battlefield. So uh, this was uh, a real 
eye-opening experience for this young lieutenant of what the Marine Corps is all about, what Marines are all about, and what Marines can accomplish if they put their minds to it. So I decided at that time, man, I'm hanging around. I'm staying in this Corps. I wore this in honor of those great Marines and phenomenal Navy corpsmen that I got to lead on the field of battle. And I think of those who gave their lives that day as a team member. And if they hadn't have done what they did, we might not have been successful. I don't look at myself as a hero. I, I look at myself as a leader of heroes. If you really want to talk about heroes, um, let's talk about that Marine who commandeered a pickup truck in Las Vegas and made 12 trips to the hospital. Think of those officers who, when everybody's running, went into the line of fire. Those are heroes. On the day I got decorated at Green Barracks, Washington, D.C., our Commandant General Green said to me after, he said, you know, Barnum, you're going to have a good career because of or in spite of that medal. It's your choice. Well, I hope to think that I did it in spite of. I've been very much involved with a number of Marine Corps uh, organizations. Marine Corps University Foundation um, is, is, a, is a great organization. Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation, Marine Corps Law Enforcement Foundation, uh, Segways for Vets. And, and this is a, just another way to give back. And if I can be the catalytic agent because of this medal to make things happen, well, by God, I'll do it. And those who have served, we got to show them our gratitude for what they've done. We can't, we got to take care of them. They carry those scars of war for many, many, many years and go through a lot of, a lot of pain and agony, as do their families. So anything we can do to make it easier for them, saying thank you for what you've done, then by God, we got to step up and do it.